Let's pray. Father, we, do we understand what it means to hide in you, to be safe in you, to be secure in you and your precious, precious son and what he accomplished at the cross and the empty tomb for us? And Father, would you open our eyes this morning so that we might understand your word? Lord, do we need you to come even from the outside into us? Do not let us rely on our own minds and our own thoughts. Penetrate us with your mind. Clarify life and death and sin, your own being, your own person, your own goodness, your own good news. Make it clear. Make the bad news clear. And we ask it in Jesus' name, amen. Please be seated. Well, let's take our Bibles. Let's open them up to Romans chapter 1. As you turn to Romans chapter 1, we're going to be in verses 24 to 32. We're going to, Lord willing, finish this chapter this morning. We just work our way through kind of one paragraph at a time. Sometimes we'll slow down and we'll take one verse at a time. I, I have a friend who preached through Romans, and it took him seven sermons to get through the first seven verses of chapter one, and I thought, all of you are going to die before I ever get done if I do that, and me too. Um, so we're going to move a little faster than that. I think there's a benefit in taking some big chunks and trying to get it all, and we might come back once in a while, and especially at the end of a chapter, and focus on some things that maybe we weren't able to say in taking bigger ch chunks, but Romans chapter one, we've been asking ourselves a series of questions at the beginning that help us kind of prime our hearts and our minds for Romans chapter 1. And this morning, I want to do that again. I want to review some of those questions, and I want to even add some questions this morning. But we've been asking questions like this. What, if anything, do you think is wrong with you? What, if anything, do you think is wrong with others, with society? You see, how you answer that question, as we've said, reveals what you think about salvation and what kind of power it takes to deliver you from wherever you are to wherever you think you need to be. We've asked questions like this. How holy is God? And how sinful is man? How sinful are you? How angry is God at sin? Sinners. Here's a new set of questions maybe to think about. Where do you think God is right now? And I mean, what is he doing in the world right now? When you look around this world, do you ever wonder, where is God in all of this? Does it feel like he kind of has his hands-off approach right now? Our passage might shock you today. And there's a new set of questions we need to ask because our passage today is going to bring us face to face with the subject of, of homosexuality. What, what do you think about homosexuality? Why is it present in our society? Why is it growing in our society? There's probably a more primary question to ask than that one, and, and it's this. What does God in his word think about homosexuality. Do you know? And will you agree? You see, Romans 1, 18 to 32 is, is, is one of the darkest parts of your Bible in regards to the bad news it reveals about us. God pulls the sheet off the defiled mess that humanity has become and he exposes us in plain sight so that we might have the opportunity to truly see what we are. And it's criminal, what we are. And this section, verses 18 to 32, it follows right on the heels of the glorious theme mentioned in verses 16 and 17 when Paul said, I am not ashamed of the gospel, the good news, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek, because in that gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, 
as it is written, but the righteous by faith shall live. And remember what Paul means when he says the gospel reveals the righteousness of God. He means it reveals the righteousness of God that God gives on the basis of faith alone and not on the basis of works, but a righteousness that he declares over the one who believes his son, Jesus. How does this hideous section in verses 18 to 32 connect with those verses? Why does the unveiling of man's wickedness and God's wrath follow immediately on the heels of Paul making it clear that God's righteousness is declared over the sinner only on the basis of faith alone in Jesus and not on the basis of good works? Well, Romans 1, 18 to 32 says something about the inability of all of us to perform a righteousness that God would accept. And verses 18 to 32 makes it clear that we're actually not even interested in God's righteousness, but we are filled with unrighteousness. Romans 1, 18 to 32 makes it perfectly clear that if we were to add any of our works to salvation, not only would salvation immediately and automatically be out of reach, but we would only provoke a holy God to even greater wrath against us. The reason God declares the sinner righteous on the basis of faith alone is because, verse 18, the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Because that which is known about God is evident within them, for God made it evident to them. For since the creation of the world... His invisible attributes, His eternal power and divine nature, they have been clearly seen, being understood through what has been made so that they are without excuse. For even though they knew God, they did not honor Him as God or give thanks, but they became futile in their speculations and their foolish heart was dark and professing to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the incorruptible God for an image in the form of corruptible man and of birds and four-footed animals and crawling reptiles. Therefore, our passage today, God gave them over in the lusts of their hearts to impurity so that their bodies would be dishonored among them. For they exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. For this reason, God gave them over to degrading passions. For their women exchanged the natural function for that which is unnatural. And in the same way also, the men abandoned the natural function of the woman and burned in their desire toward one another, men with men, committing indecent acts and receiving in their own persons the due penalty of their error. And just as they did not see fit to acknowledge God any longer, God gave them over to a depraved mind to do those things which are not proper, being filled with all unrighteousness, being filled with all wickedness, being filled with all greed, being filled with all evil, full of envy, full of murder, full of strife, full of deceit, full of malice. They are gossips, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, arrogant, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, without understanding, untrustworthy, unloving, unmerciful. And although they know the ordinance of God, that those who practice such things are worthy of death, they not only do the same, but also give hearty approval to those who practice them. God is pouring out wrath on sinners right now. How will those who are condemned under wrath save themselves? And Paul's point in Romans 1, 18 to 32 is that it won't even cross your mind to think of being saved by God unless 
He acts in the power of the gospel to save you. Paul's whole point here is that you can't, in and of yourself, even see how guilty and hostile you are to God unless he does something with this mind of yours and opens your eyes with the truth of his word. Paul's whole point is that you aren't thinking about salvation until the Savior approaches you and that you won't even think about the right kind of power that it takes to save you unless you hear the gospel preached, which is the power of God for salvation. Paul's point is that you won't fathom the greatness of the standard of righteousness that persuades God to turn from his wrath and save. Let me review for you. Here's what we talked about last week. Here's what the passage is about overall, verses 18 to 32. Before the gospel saves, it makes man face three fearful realities regarding God's wrath. Last week, we talked about the wrath of God is revealed, verse 18. The idea there in verse 18 is it is presently being revealed. He's not talking about the future day of wrath. There is one of those coming. But right now, today, the wrath of God is revealed. We saw that the source of that wrath is God. It is of God, is the wrath of God that is being revealed from heaven. It's a, it's a wrath unlike any kind of wrath you've ever seen here expressed by man. The objects of the wrath in verse 18 are the ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who, who are suppressing the truth. And that truth in wrath isn't helping men to be saved. It's only being suppressed by men who don't want to be saved. That then, that suppression leads to the second fearful reality regarding God's wrath that we saw last week, the wrath of God deserved. That's his argument in verses 19 to 23. First, there were three inexcusable evidences against us. That which is known about God is evident within them, verse 19. And the reason it is evident within us is because God made that which is known about him evident to us. And when he makes something evident, it's evident. What in particular? God's eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen in the sense that it has been understood. Verse 20, three inexcusable evidences. And then the wrath of God is deserved in that there were six indefensible offenses. Do you remember that? Even though they knew God. They knew God, they didn't honor God. They knew God, they didn't thank God. They knew God, they became futile. They knew God, their foolish heart was darkened. They knew God, they became fools. They knew God, and they exchanged his glory for an image. Paul declared first that the wrath of God is being revealed and that the wrath of God is deserved secondly. And now he's going to come back to flesh out in what sense is the deserved wrath of God being revealed right now. That takes us to the third fearful reality today regarding God's wrath, and that is the wrath of God inflicted. What's going on in verses 24 to 32? Well, in verses 18 to 23, man sinned, rejected God, perpetrated countless crimes against God. Verse 24, therefore, God as judge acted. Man sinned as he did, in verses 18 to 23, therefore, verse 24, God inflicted judgment on them as he did. How do we know that God has inflicted wrath on men? Well, there are three proofs of it seen in this one terrifying statement said three times. God gave them over. In verse 24, God gave them over. That's proof of his inflicted wrath. Verse 26, God gave them over. That's proof of his inflicted wrath. Verse 28, God gave them over. That's proof of his inflicted wrath. In other words, whenever you see the results of this divine giving over of man, you are looking at the proof that the wrath of God is being revealed. And that is what 24 to 32 is all about. Three proofs that God's wrath is inflicted when he gives man over. So let me summarize for you before we actually walk through them one by one. The proof is found, just, as, just to give you a view of the whole section, the proof is found in their bodies being dishonored, verse 24 and 25. When you see bodies being dishonored, and all, that results, all the results tied to that, that's the proof that God's wrath is inflicted upon us. The proof is found in verses 26 to 27, their passions are degraded, And when you see that, 
and expressions as it is described here, that is proof that God's wrath is inflicted. And then in verses 28 down to 32, their minds are depraved. That's the proof that his wrath is being inflicted. When, when you see the improper things that come out from a depraved mind, you see proof that God's wrath is inflicted right now. So before we look at those three, we need to get to the bottom of what does this mean that God gave them over? I'm going to point out the obvious to you and then illustrate it. The subject of that simple clause, God gave them over, is God. The subject doing the action is God. The verb is active, meaning God is actively the one doing the action. God is actively the one giving over. Them are the ones who are the receivers of the action. The action of giving over that God is doing is happening to them, the sinners perpetrating crimes against God. It's really actually very simple to understand. God is very active in it. Now let me give you an illustration. Imagine you walk into a prison and the inmates there are all convicted criminals. There is inexcusable evidence against them. They committed indefensible offenses. They are guilty in that prison. If you were to enter that prison and ask any one of the criminals there, how did you get into this prison? Here's what they would not tell you. Well, I was in the courtroom, and the judge sentenced me and slammed his gavel down, but then he turned away and he left me to myself. And then I don't know what happened, but then I just found myself here locked up in this prison cell. Rather, what would each criminal tell you? this. The judge sentenced me in the courtroom, and then he handed me over to this prison. From the moment the gavel slammed down with the guilty verdict, there was only a judicial hand upon the back of the criminal, pushing him out of the courtroom, pushing, pushing him forward and toward the prison. The, the criminal felt the active judicial hand of the judge on his back as he was pushed down the hall, and finally the criminal left and felt the judicial hand of the judge pushing him into the cell and the door slamming behind him. The judge gave him over to the prison. The judge was very active, had his hand on him the whole way. There was no hands-off approach of the judge. That is not unfair. That is not unrighteous. That's not unjust. It's right, and we know it. It's just it's deserved. And that is us before a holy God. God gave them over. Three times Paul says this. God did not take his holy, unrestraining hands off of his enemies and then left us to ourselves as we lowered ourselves further down into the abyss of God's wrath below. God gave them over doesn't mean anything like that. Rather, God put his holy judicial hands on our backs and he delivered us down, down into the cesspool of our filthy sin that we loved instead of him already. And there we were imprisoned judicially by him. God was not hands off in giving over his enemies. The wrath of God is revealed from heaven whenever you see the evidences where God has put his judicial hand on us and has given us over. Let me take you back to some of the questions. What do you think is wrong with you? Do you even know? That God has sentenced you and handed you over to your prison. And what do you think you need to be delivered from? What has to happen so that the holy judge will take his judicial hand off of you and instead lift you up and out? And do you ever wonder where God is in this world? Well, this tells you. He's actively present today. Everywhere. Giving sinners his enemies over to their prisons. Now let's take this one at a time. Where? Where is the proof of this? 
First, the proof is found, number one, in our dishonored bodies, verse 24 to 25. This is the first God gave them over in verse 24. And notice again our prior guilt. Um, this should be more than obvious from this passage. He gave them over in the lusts of their hearts. That's the condition we were already in when he gave us over. God did not take morally neutral, morally undecided customers or applicants for salvation, and, but then mercilessly grab them and push them into a cell. No, we, we were in our sinful lust. We were in our criminal cravings. We're not customers. We're criminals. We weren't looking to be driven by someone else or something else outside of us. We were already being driven at the heart level, at the inner man level, by sinful criminal cravings. All our crimes were committed against God because of what was going on in our hearts. There's no one else to blame for where we are in our prison status but our own lusts and our own cravings. And God judicially gave us over in the lusts of our hearts. To what? What is our prison cell, so to speak? Verse 24, to impurity. Now, is that the unexpected, perhaps? In our judicial system, we hand the criminal over to a cell where he can no longer commit his crimes against society. But God delivers his enemies here into impurity. This word is often associated with sexual impurity. And the context here will affirm that this is indeed sexual impurity. We are bound, we are imprisoned to the very impurity flowing in and through the lusts of our own hearts. We loved this more than God, and he gave us over to it, he imprisoned us in it, and this should be terrifying to you. He's holding us guilty until that day, that day of judgment. His wrath is not reformative. It's punitive. How are we going to escape that? His judicial holy hand pushed us there and locked the door. And God's holiness is not compromised at all in so doing. If in reading this, the first thought that comes to your mind is whether or not God is holy in doing something like this, that's telling. Why is not the first concern in reading this your own guilt? And now your own inability to escape a sexual impurity on your own. Again, what do you think is wrong with you? What do you think you need to be delivered from? Whom do you think you need to be delivered from? And what kind of power will be needed to do that? The result of God giving them over in the lusts of their heart to sexual impurity is verse 24, so that their bodies would be dishonored. Dishonored bodies, in what sense? Well, that's going to get spelled out further in the coming verses. But, but notice this dishonoring of our, of our bodies happens among them, verse 24. That tells you we're not alone in our cell. We are dishonoring our bodies together, mutually. We're helping it happen among us. The dishonoring of our bodies is, is the result of God's judicial hand pushing us into the prison of our sexual impurity. He is just. We are guilty. We are imprisoned. And the day of wrath is coming. We are locked into our very crimes against God until that day. How will you get out when you deserve all this, when I do too? Verse 25, Paul reminds us of our Guilt, once again, echoing our rejection of God that was first mentioned in the first part of this in 18 to 23. We are the ones, verse 25, who exchange the truth of God for a lie. And you should read that as the lie. That would be the more accurate translation. We exchange the truth of God for the lie. In Romans 1.18, we suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Here we are said to have exchanged it or traded it. We, we just abandoned it for something else. And again, what that presupposes is that we, we heard the truth of God, we knew the truth about God, we understood its contents, that it was about God, and we rejected the truth about God, and we started looking for something else to exchange for it. What? The lie. 
Well, what is the lie? Um, it, it's idolatry. Look at verse 25. They exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worship the, and serve the creature rather than the creator. Did you notice what Paul just linked together in our prison? There is an inseparable connection between our heart lusts of, or cravings, our sexual impurity, and our religious practice, our idolatry. Our bodies are being dishonored by sexual impurity, and us being religious in our prison, that's inseparable. We're religious in this cell. Now, are you tempted to excuse yourself from this description of idolatry? I mean, was this idolatry only for ancient people groups or even today remote people groups, but not for sophisticated Westerners like us? Let me just help you think about this a little bit. There are only two categories that everything and everyone can fall into. There's the creator and there's created things, right? Right? And what God's word tells us is that we are worshipers by God's created design. And that worship mode in us can never be powered off. We just are worshipers. And so that means there are only two worship options. We will worship the creator or as worshipers we will worship created things or the creature. You and I are worshipers, and you are worshiping something or someone right now, and your options are either the creator, God, or the created thing, or the creature. And most commonly, uh, what sophisticated Westerners do is they, they worship themselves or the cravings of their own hearts. Nowhere in Scripture, including this passage, will you find a third category especially one that is morally neutral or undecided. You will also find nowhere in Scripture, including this passage, that you've turned off your worship mode somehow. You found the button and just turned it off. You are religious no matter. You are either a worshiper of the Creator outside the prison of His wrath, or you are a worshiper in your prison cell, worshiping most likely yourself and or your sexual impurity your appetites. You see, idolatry and sexual impurity are inseparable. That's just what idolaters do. We didn't stay in the bounds of worship, so why, what makes us think we'll stay in the bounds sexually? And all of that is bound up in the lie that we traded God for. What a tragic and dark scene Paul is painting here. The the prison at the bottom of the abyss of God's wrath that God gave us over to, it's a, it's a criminal place. It's a horrific place. It's a place where his enemies continue on in their rejection of him, imprisoned in their sexual impurity and in their idolatry. And Paul, in describing all that, he can't help but just interrupt himself for a moment and explode into the praise and the worship of God that God deserves. Look at verse 25. They worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. Worship just popped right through right there because Paul couldn't take it anymore. He couldn't bear the thought of this blessed God being treated this way. So he added his own praise to the dark scene. He speaks well of the judge that enemies of God hate vehemently because he gave them over into his wrath. So whenever you see this, whenever you see dishonored bodies, dishonored in their sexual impurity and idolatry, you are seeing what God is doing in the world right now. He is wrathful. He gave his enemies over to this. And when you see it, it's proof that the wrath of God is inflicted now. The next proof is connected to this one. The next proof is both a confirmation of this first one, but it's an expansion on what Paul just said. Verse 26 begins with, for this reason, for this reason that our idolatry and sexual impurity are viciously feeding off one another, and therefore our bodies are dishonored because God gave us over to this, secondly, there is proof of God's wrath inflicted. Where? Well, the proof is found, number two, in our degraded passions, verses 26 and 27, in our degraded passions. Our sexual impurity was mentioned in verse 24. It's something like 
a prison that God gave us over to. And here is the expanded way of describing that prison. God gave them over to degrading passions, verse 26. Degrading passions, illicit sexual passions. Well, what does Paul mean by degrading passions? Well, look at verse 26. For their women exchanged the natural function for that which is unnatural. Now, on the surface, when you read that, you might in your first initial reading think, that's a little cryptic. That's a little mysterious statement. I, I, I think I know what he means. Well, if there's any doubt about what this degrading passion is in verse 26, all you have to do is read verse 27, and it becomes crystal clear. And in the same way also as what he just said about the women exchanging the natural function for that which is unnatural, also the men abandoned the natural function of the woman and burned in their desire toward one another. Men with men committing indecent acts. He's talking about homosexuality. The degrading passions is homosexuality. Just back up and think about where we've been. Let's back up and, and kind of walk back to where we are here. Think about what Romans 1 is saying. This is a judgment context, right? Right? We are worshipers by design, but we threw away the worship of God to worship ourselves. Verse 23, we exchanged the glory of God. Verse 25, we exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator. God made himself known to us. Verse 19, the truth of God was clear to us, but we chose the lie of idolatry instead of him. We are steeped in the lusts and the cravings of our hearts, and so God judicially put his hand on our back, and he headed us down the hall, and he judicially pushed us into the prison that we earned and that we had merited. That prison is our imprisonment to our sexual impurity in which we will dishonor our bodies together. We are imprisoned to our degrading passages, uh, passions and express that in our homosexual practices. When you see that in a life, in a woman, in a man, what are you seeing? You are seeing the present wrath of God being inflicted. You're seeing God's judgment. He says it again in verse 27. They are receiving in their own persons the due penalty of their error. When you see that in a life, it is proof of God's wrath. If we deny God, if we deny that He is God and we don't honor Him as God, what prevents us from denying the natural design God made for heterosexual sex in the context of marriage? If we made the most severe and the most tragic and the most criminal denial first, the denial of God, what prevents us from denying what is natural in sex? If we crossed the boundary of worshiping the creature instead of the creator, it's actually an easier thing to cross the sexual purity boundary. And this is exactly what God gave us over to in wrath. Boundless idolaters, idolaters with no boundaries, imprisoned now to their boundless sexual impurity. Listen, we had no... Um, interest in obeying God's holy passions. So he imprisoned us to be enslaved by our own degrading passions. What a thing to say today in our culture. But you need to know that God has been saying this since Sodom and Gomorrah. He's been saying this to every church in church history since AD 56, when Paul wrote this. And just to help you understand the kind of day that Paul wrote this in, like he was writing about, well, we, we don't do this as Romans, but someday probably somebody will do this. Just so you understand, it, it is said that the first 
14 of 15 Roman emperors were homosexual. Now, for you to try to understand that, it would be something like saying the last 14 of 15 presidents of the United States were homosexual. Could you imagine something like that being said? What would that say about where our culture had gone? Do you see how normalized homosexuality was in the prison of sexual impurity and degrading passions in first century Rome? And in Paul's day, men were actually praised more for having a young man for their degrading passions rather than having a wife. Paul had to say these things all across the Roman Empire to a people who were steeped in homosexuality. And we find Paul even saying this amazing thing in 1 Corinthians 6, what? And such were some of you. That's where you used to be, he said. But the gospel was the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. Uh, let's allow this context to help us just think clearly and biblically about this on a couple of things. Whatever a person may say to you, whatever our culture might say to us about how natural homosexuality is, we know the Bible says just the opposite. It does. It is unnatural. The opposite gender was designed by God to be the natural complement to the other gender sexually in the context of marriage. And again, what does this passage say about where expressions of homosexual activity come from? They don't come from our genes, but from the due penalty of the error that God gave us over in the prison of our degrading passions. Listen, homosexuality has a far greater connection to God's wrath than it does to our genes. It is evidence of God's present wrath. We live in a day where the the church and Christian colleges and Christian parachurch groups and mission agencies are caving on this left and right. The church is actually asking the question, "Can can God bless a homosexual relationship. I need to, I think I need to rethink that. Well, read this. Think. I hope this passage answers that kind of question clearly for you. How can God's blessing be on homosexuality when it is the evidence of his wrath, the due penalty of of their error? It is evidence of his anger against those who exchanged him for the lie. So whenever you see degrading passions being expressed through what is called in verse 27, indecent or shameful homosexual acts, you are looking at evidence that God gave man over in judgment. Wrath is being inflicted. And there's one last proof that God's wrath is being inflicted. Where? The proof is, in, is found, number three, in our depraved minds. Verse 28. In verse 28, there's the word and, and that adds one more proof of the wrath of God being inflicted now. The main statement or the main clause is found halfway down through verse 28. You can see it there. It says, God gave them over to a depraved mind. That means to a worthless mind. Do you see the prison that God marched his enemies to with his holy judicial hand on their back? Here's the prison his enemies have merited from him. It's called a depraved mind. That is what we have been judicially handed over to. And here are the descriptions of our prison we've been handed over to by God. We live in a prison of sexual impurity, verse 24, a prison of degrading passions, verse 26, and a a prison of depraved or worthless minds. And I just ask again, what do you think is wrong with you? What do you think is wrong with man? And what kind of power will it take to spring us from this prison cell? And if you have been judicially imprisoned to a worthless and depraved mind, can you trust your mind's assessment or measurement or conclusion about what you think is wrong with you? Can you trust your mind's assessment 
of what you think a solution is? Can you trust your mind's assessment of what you think is natural, sexually speaking? How has that mind served you and me according to Romans 1? How did that mind assess the truth of God when it presented itself? How did that mind handle the lie that came to us? I mean, it got everything upside down. God pushed you and me into the prison of a worthless mind. How is that mind going to think its way out? It won't. It's not even crossing that mind. He adds to it in verse 28. They did not see fit to acknowledge God any longer. That's what that depraved mind does. The other way of saying this was back in Romans 1.21. Even though they knew God, they did otherwise. And it's said again in verse 32, even though and although they know the ordinance of God, they know the commandment of God, they did otherwise. You see, listen, the problem for you and me is not that we don't know the truth about God. It's not that we do not know, uh, that we do, the problem is that we do know, but we know with a mind that is worthless and it betrays us with what we know. And there's a play on words here in verse 28. He can't see it in the English, but it goes something like this. Just as they disapproved of the knowledge of God, God gave them over to a disapproved mind. Or just as they disqualified the knowledge of God, God gave them over to a disqualified mind. That's the prison that we deserve. That's the prison we have merited. That's the prison we have earned that a holy God judicially pushed us into. And what happened with that mind? Did that worthless mind just contain itself and all of its worthless thoughts to its own inner worthless meditation? No. Verse 28. He gave them over to a depraved mind to do those things, to do stuff, to do those things which are not proper. Well, what improper things is a worthless, discarded, refused mind? Fuel, outwardly speaking. What does prison life look like in the cell of the depraved mind? There are 21 different descriptions here. 21. Paul takes a, his first breath and he drops four of them. Then he takes a second breath and he drops five of them. And then he takes one last huge breath and he drops 12 of them. And when you see these improper things, you are seeing the wrath of God presently being poured out. These are the proofs that we've been banished to a depraved mind, judicially so. Here's Paul's first breath. The first four start with being filled with all. Do you see that in verse 29? Being filled with all. In other words, these first four are not tempered or carefully measured out by us so as to not display too much of it. Being filled with all unrighteousness. Just full stop. Isn't that the problem? Isn't that the problem? This is why the gospel reveals God's righteousness, because we are filled with all unrighteousness, because our unrighteousness dominates us. It fills us. How on earth could we, from that overflowing unrighteousness, ever generate our own righteousness that God would accept? There's only one righteousness in your prison that God will accept that could move him to deliver you, and it is a righteousness that you don't possess, but that he's willing to give on the basis of faith alone in Jesus. Being filled with all wickedness. That's unrestrained hostility against others in the cell. Being filled with all greed. That's the relentless urge in the prison to acquire more from others. Being filled with all evil in the prison, full of the desire to injure each other and hurt each other. When you see these improper things, you are looking into the prison of a depraved mind that God judicially pushed us into. It's evidence of his wrath. Paul takes a second breath, and he drops five more, full of envy. That's the hate that arises in the heart toward one who is above us in the prison cell, or one who is what we are not, or who possesses what we can't get in the cell. And then we are full of murder in the prison. That follows right on the heels of envy. That's like Cain killing Abel after Abel's sacrifice was accepted, but Cain's wasn't. Envy led to murder. Full of strife. 
If we won't kill each other in our prison cell, we'll at least contend with each other at every possible point. Full of deceit, we bait and switch each other out to manipulate each other. Full of malice, we hate each other. And when you see these improper kinds of things, you're looking into the lifestyle of the prison of a depraved mind that God judicially pushed us into. It's evidence of his wrath. Here's his last breath. They are gossips. We whisper about each other in our prison, peddling evil reports about one another. We are slanderers in our prison, openly misrepresenting each other. We are haters of God. That pretty much says it all. If we're this way in the prison of a depraved mind, how will we turn to God if we hate God? We are insolent. We treat each other with contempt in the prison cell, just like we treated God with contempt. And the next two together, arrogant and boastful. We have way too high of an opinion of ourselves in our prison, and we make big claims about ourselves in the prison. In that prison... We're inventing evil. We're looking for more hateful methods of offending God and hurting others. And do you know what else we do in that dreadful, awful prison of a depraved mind? Kids, we, we disobey our parents. When you see disobedience to parents, kids, that's actually evidence of God's wrath upon us, and we need a Savior. I mean, look at the other items in this list and, and, and be sure to not think about disobeying parents as something not as bad as murder or dangerous as wickedness. Disobeying parents runs with wickedness in prison. We are without understanding there. There's no discernment in that prison cell that's going to think of the right way to get out. We are untrustworthy in that prison. We are faithless. Nobody should put any confidence in us. We don't keep our word in that prison. And we are unloving in that prison. In Paul's day, it was a word that was used for infanticide, meaning if you had a baby and you didn't want the baby, you just gave birth to the baby and left the baby out in the street. You exposed the infant. Or if your infant was born weak, you drowned it. Or if your baby was born deformed, you drowned your little baby girl or boy. Today, we would call that abortion. You see that? It's evidence of God's wrath. We are unmerciful. We are not willing in that prison to make peace with anybody. We won't cease from hostilities. And when you see these improper things, you are looking into the lifestyle of the prison of a depraved mind that God judicially pushed us into. It's evidence of his wrath. And here is the tragic truth about us all in the prison of a depraved mind. <laughs> Look at verse 32. We know these things well enough. And although they knew the ordinance of God, we knew the commandment of God. We knew that we were bad enough that there is actually a rule from God against these things. We know the violation, and we know what the violation is. It's, it's that those who practice such things are actually worthy of death. We know that they are bad enough that we should be executed in the prison we are in. But the disgrace goes even deeper. It's the evil of all evils. We actually not only do the same, but we also give hearty approval to those who practice them. We actually cheer and applaud one another on in our prison cell of evil. We are lost. We are evil. And God is wrathful now. So I want to ask you again as we finish, where is God in this world right now? He is not hands-off. He is actively wrathful towards us all. Romans 1.18, the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. He gave us over in his holy wrath to prisons 
we don't want to escape, but we will certainly die in if someone else doesn't act on our behalf. So where is God? He is pouring out his wrath, securing us in our guilt until the day of wrath and judgment. But do you know what else is true right now? What? That God is present in this world offering good news. The gospel. What? The active judge is the Savior who already acted. Jesus Christ suffered the wrath of God as a substitute at his cross. He committed none of these improper things. He only had a pure heart. He only had a holy mind. And his body wasn't dishonored by any sin. Except when he hung on the cross and was dishonored by mine and yours, believer. But God poured out his wrath on his son for those who believe the wrath that they merited. Jesus bore in full on the cross. God is preaching that good news. As a result of his son's shed blood at the cross, the holy judge is walking back down the hall of the prison to your cell, and with that judicial hand that shoved you in the cell, he now reaches through the bars in mercy and says, trust me, believe my son. Believe that what my son and I did at his cross and empty tomb is sufficient to save you. Don't work for anything in here. There is nothing in you, there is nothing going on in the cell that would ever, ever appeal to me. Believe and believe only, and you shall be saved. I will declare over you a righteousness that will turn my wrath away, because Jesus turned it away at the cross in his death. Believe and my righteousness is yours. And where, God would say, where I see my righteousness, I see. I deliver. Have you believed Jesus this way? Will you believe Jesus this way? Let's pray. When and if you will come out of the prison of your sin and the prison of God's wrath by faith alone. When you come out, you will see that all you have is Jesus and all you need is Jesus. Father in heaven, thank you for your son Jesus. Thank you for his death at the cross for your enemies. Father, we cannot merit any saving action from you. The only thing that we have merited from you is the wrath that we are experiencing even today on us. Oh, Father, Romans 1, 24 to 32 describes me, what I made of myself. Oh, but Lord, may Romans 1, 16 and 17 be the good news and joy today for those who believe. Lord, would you open the eyes and the hearts and the minds of those who are in their prison cell and have not yet been released by your power in the gospel to save them on the basis of faith alone. Turn them away from trying to work for their own righteousness and turn them to Jesus so that all they have is Jesus and so that all they recognize is that they only need him and him alone. It's in his great name we pray, amen.